good thing. So, let me turn this ring off so the phone doesn't ring. You got your Bibles with you today. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. If you don't, we got it up on the screens if you can read it. All right? But some things that we're going to be covering here as we solve up the whole book of Corinthians, we've been in for quite some months now, is it's going to talk about giving. It's going to talk about doing the Lord's work. It'll talk about faithful living. And we're going to talk about love within the Christian fellowship. In fact, we'll see that the entire theme of the whole book of Corinthians was basically love. From, from start to finish, it was love. And that's a, such an important theme, should be the main theme in our lives as well, too, is love. You know, there's a lot of things talked about within that theme of love, within this book. But that's where it goes back toward again, here at the end of the book of Corinthians. So let me, let me read something, too, before I forget. Because usually when I do these reading things, I forget about them. Some of them are so good. But I found this thing about companionship. And I'll tell you one thing, as I do chaplaincy in the week, and you know, I gotta like write a note all the time with everybody I visit, like what did I provide, what did I do? And a lot of times I provided companionship. I came by somebody who's having a hard time dying, or is demented, or laying in bed, or you know maybe they're with it, but they know that death is coming soon, and I provide companionship. And so this kind of really grabbed me when I read it, and it goes along with our sermon today too, and about the middle of it, but I know if I wait to that point, I'll forget all about it. You won't get to hear this, okay? So let me read it to you. One of the finest compliments we can be paid is for our Christian friends to say that we are refreshing to be around. Isn't that a good compliment? If somebody says it's refreshing to be around you, I mean, it's a bad one. They're like, oh, man, not that guy again. <laughs> not that again. But it's good to be, be loved and wanted to be around, isn't it? That's a, and if somebody feels that way about you, it'll make you feel pretty good. That is a mark of true companionship. Just as companionship is a mark of true love, companionship builds up God's family. Companionship can help heal our wounds even before our friends know we hurt. It can comfort us even when those around us are not aware of our sorrow. It can encourage us even if we ourselves hardly realize that we are discouraged. Companionship is also a preventive. Just being with loving Christian friends can keep us from getting hurt, from falling into sin, or from losing heart. One of the surest ways we can get into spiritual trouble is by neglecting fellowship with other believers. The Corinthians had violated fellowship with, other, with their factions, their lawsuits, their sexual sins, their proud abuse of the gifts, and their desecration of the supreme Christian fellowship, the Lord's Table. So they've gotten into some trouble right there. And, you know, Paul in his love tried to bring him back in again and tell him, hey, you guys are going left, going the wrong way here. Let me get you back in the right way here and bring you back. But isn't that true? And I remember, I have told you this before, but it stuck out to me so much. But I read a book once by a guy, it's a Christian psychologist, Larry Crabb, and he said in all his years of psychology and his doctoral stuff and his professional practices, he said the one Thing that we can do with one another is to is to really be able to communicate with one another to really be able to have somebody we can talk to who will listen to us and we'll listen to them and we'll be able to have that kind of fellowship right there and it is connection that's what he called it it's that true connection if we can connect to somebody else besides ourselves somebody else in life they can help us so much more with all of life and I think that kind of connects with this with this chapter too here as we sum up the book of Corinthians. But here in the first verse it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. Now what is this collection for the saints? It goes all the way through the book of Acts and book of Galatians and all over the place. What had happened at the Council of Jerusalem, when they, when they recognized Paul as an apostle, when they talked to him, they asked him one thing, or a couple of things, but one of the things they asked him was they said, bring back some money for our widows and our orphans. You know, do some collection for us. Because Jerusalem was a big city. The temple from the Jews took care of people, but Christians were pretty much ousted from the temple. They weren't well loved at the temple because they were preaching Jesus Christ as God and they killed Jesus because he said that he was God. They said he was a heretic, they killed him, 
So, and there was a lot of need, and even though a lot of them had sold their houses and they were a communal church, they were still in a rough shape there, okay? It was an expensive place to live at the time for the people there. So all around here, Paul's been collecting money all the time for these people in Jerusalem, for, for the, for the, and it says for the saints, for the saints in Jerusalem, which the saints are believers, okay? You don't see non-Christians called saints. Does a saint mean you're a perfect person? No, nope, none of us are perfect people. It just means you believe in Jesus Christ and that his righteousness has righteous you and you are now a saint in Christ. And if you look through the word, it's the, uh, we should first be taking care of those within the church even before we take care of those outside the church. You know, we are to take care of those outside the church. We can think of the Good Samaritan and the guy on the highway and how we should extend stuff toward them as well. But also we should be taking care of one another. And some verses that would correlate with this would be Romans 15, 26 and 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. So that's what he's doing. He's taking this collection and he says, On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. So he wasn't going to try and come and do some big spiel about give me some money and let's, let's get it out of you. And like the way I'm sure every one of you have sat in services like that, where it's like they just talk about money and money and money, and then they take an offering. In some churches, I'm, I, 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 I've become much more familiar with the black community over the years. Some black type churches, they'll take three to five offerings in one service. Some folks, they'll lock the door and no one can leave until enough money has been given to meet the needs. Talk about some pressure, huh? I wouldn't want to go back to a church like that. I've got some black brothers, and they told me that maybe their lost brother or somebody they knew won't go back to church because of that. And I, they can understand, and I can understand. That's not the right way. You know, we don't want to do that. And that's, it shouldn't be ever like that. And Paul didn't want that either. Look what he says. He goes, you know, you guys ought to be giving every week. People should be giving. So it's not like some kind of thing that people are trying to pull all the money out or different things. And... Uh, and one thing I, I wrote up here, we cannot share gifts without sharing fellowship. It's a part of worship here. So, so if we're going to be giving to the church, giving different things, we're also going to be sharing in fellowship. You know, sometimes some folks, they can't get to church, and they do what they can, and they still give to a church. But whenever I hear that, I think it's so sad. You know, I, I run into people sometimes as I'm doing my chaplaincy, and they're like, they're like, oh yeah, I've been a member of this church forever, but haven't been there decades. But I sure do. I give, I give all the time, so I give to them. And I'm thinking, man, are you missing out? If you're giving to this church, but you're not going to the church, if you don't have the fellowship, if you're not getting fed, I'm like, it, well, it's horrible. It's a terrible spot to be in. I mean, I'm sure the church is happy that they're they're getting some extra monies and stuff, but what a, a missing out is happening. It's not just about giving, but it's... It, giving's a, a part of worship is what it is. It's one of the ways we worship God. And I always say with giving, giving's a hard subject. You know, giving's what I'm talking about when I said you may have to chew on something and then leave it for later and then look at it again. Don't like run off and just give up. You know, but the Bible does talk about giving. But I believe the reason God wants us to give to the Lord and even sacrificially to the Lord is so that money doesn't own us. Because it's easy for us to have money as the idol of our life. And it's the only thing that rules us, that reigns in us, and guides everything. And at the end of the day, when you die, you don't take it with you. It's gone. Okay? It just disappears and it's gone. It's much better to live a life that is full and not one that's so tight with money. That, yeah, you may add up a lot of money, but if you look at a guy who added up that much money and a guy who just loved the Lord and gave as he went along and didn't live life as such a tight fellow like that, you'll see a much happier life, a much more fulfilled life. And that's where uh, that's where money comes. And I really believe, does God need it? No. He says he owns everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, was the old saying that's in the Bible that he says. But he owns everything. He doesn't need it. I really believe we need it to be able to keep giving up of ourselves and giving to him. And it's not easy for any of us. Because it's that vice that gets a hold of every one of us, and it makes it hard for us to give. But that's what he was talking about here. So he's letting them know, hey, when I come by, I'm going to take an offering, and let's not make it a big deal or anything, and let's not have some kinds of stress about it. And he said on the first day of every week, that's Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. 
which is also a place here in Scripture that we can see that they met every Sunday for worship. It was weekly worship on Sunday. It was not on the Sabbath day, Saturday. It was on Sunday because that's the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. And that was a part of worship when it was given. And it says, and I have a few verses about this as well. Jesus said in Luke, he said, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Alright, so, and so uh, I wrote, Our giving reflects our commitment to God. And that, that's a pretty intense thing right there. But it does, and like I said, it doesn't have to be all right now, right here, boom, we're 100%. I don't believe anything with God goes 100% that fast other than the moment he saves you, okay? Outside that, everything is a process with God. It takes time. We grow with God. We're not always at the same spot. Even in our own lives, we're not at the same spot. It's a constant thing of growth is where it goes on. But if we, if we try to stifle this growth of giving in our lives where we refuse to give, it's going to stifle other areas in our life as well. It's just bound to happen. It's like you can only go so far and then you block yourself from going any further because you put up this demand that's not a godly demand that I will not do that. And then the next thing you know, that's as far as you can go too because you, get, you hit that wall. All right, And it's a hard place to be. But this verse goes on. It says, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? So I wrote, it really can affect our way forward. And what are the true riches that Jesus is talking about? But the riches of heaven, the riches of living life the way God wants us to live life. Living life to the fullest extent. You know, if, if we can't be faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, you know, just little worldly stuff, how are we going to get the the heavenly type of stuff. And that's the question. I'm not trying to be a, a prosperity preacher. By all means, you know I'm not a prosperity preacher. I rarely ever even talk on money, okay? I mean, I really don't. I, I only talk about it when it hits the text. So it talks about a little bit of the text today. So we talk about it. But it, can, it really can affect our way forward. And if we're really tight in areas. And a lot of these things we're speaking about today can also be good principles. You know, I don't know if you ever... Look at principles in life. One time I was in the Army, and I had a captain with me, a good captain. I liked him a lot. And he told me, he said, you know, Buck, he goes, I've really been thinking. He goes, it's not so much about knowing all the little things. It's about knowing the principles. If I can grab the principles in life, if I can operate off of a sets of principles and apply them to different areas of my life, I can have such a better life, and everything will go forward so much easier. Where if I get caught in little things... It's like little thing, little thing, little thing. Principle is like, whoo, here's a big principle. Here's another big principle. And when I get familiar with the principles of life, I can, I can move through life and live life much better than not. And this isn't just applying the money, I think. I mean, if, you, if God gives you some stuff and you're not faithful with it, how are you going to get more stuff? How are you going to grow more? You know, this principle can be affected in a lot of areas in our life, in our relationships, and all kinds of things, is if we're not willing to, 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 to do good with what the little God's given us, how are we going to get more from God? You know, we got to do good with the things that God has given us before we can step up. And I heard a guy say this morning, it's like a bicycle. You don't start a kid with a 26-inch bicycle, you know, a full-size bike. You start a kid on a little tricycle, you know, even maybe a tinier than a tricycle, you know, a little tiny toy thing. You, Scoots around on a little bit. And in time, the kid will start riding. In time, he's riding a regular bicycle on the street or something. A 10-speed or 26-speed or whatever the speeds are these days. Maybe motorcycle. You know, he, he steps up eventually. But we all start with little. And as we get better with the little we got, we move on from there. That There's, there's very few people. I, I see some gifted people sometimes. You can do some kind of skill and be really good at it all of a sudden. That's never been me. And I don't know how many of you it's ever been. If you have a special skill that you're very gifted in, you should be using that skill, that's for sure, because God gave you that gift. But for most of us, we've got to work really hard at the little bit that we have in order to get a little bit farther, a little bit farther. And that's the way life is. It's the principle of life. And sometimes you may get a hard stop and block, and you have a hard time. You just have to sit back, take a moment, don't lose your trust in the Lord, don't forget to pray to God, and in that time do a lot of praying, do a lot of trusting in God, and all of a sudden you see you're starting to move forward again, all right? But don't give up. I tell you, that's one of the big...
biggest principles in all life is don't give up, you know. Don't give up on God, for sure. That's the main thing. And if you don't give up on God and you don't give up on the things that He's given you to, to be with, you're going you're gonna to keep going forward. So, and also Proverbs has a good verse. It says, There is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results only in want. How many folks do you know that may have gathered up all the monies in the world, and they live like eating Cheerios or something? I don't know. You, know, you watch these TV shows, and they're like reusing dirty water and doing all kinds of things all the time, and, and they're saving all kinds of money, but you're like, whoa, how are they living like that, though? But yet, in one way, maybe some of us could be living like that at times, too, because we're getting so tight with things, and yet you see somebody else who gives and gives, and they always have more to give more, and they keep going forward. And it's a beautiful thing, and that's the Bible verse. It says right here, 1124, there's one who scatters, and yet increases all the more. You know, like you spread out what you got, and you keep getting more. There's one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results only in want. And I'll tell you... It's just like the Bible with the, the rich young ruler that went to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, he said, I do all the commandments. I follow everything that the Lord has given me. And, and what shall I do for salvation? How am I to be saved? I'm doing everything. And you know what Jesus told him? Because Jesus personally knew. And this wasn't something that applies to every single one of us. Okay, because we'd all be widows and orphans in the church then. And have a hard time if we all did what Jesus told this man to do. But he said, sell everything that you've got and give it to the poor, and then you'll be saved. And it says the rich young ruler wasn't willing to do that. He just walked away. Because that <coughs> meant more to him than God meant to him. And that's one of the reasons I say giving is important, because if money gets to be that important to you, that it's more important than God to you, that is, that's horrible. That's the worst it could ever be. Worst it could ever be. All right? God's never going to ask you to give everything that you've got and be left with nothing, because he also tells us to be a faithful steward of our money, different things like that. But for that guy, he did, because that vice was the biggest vice on his life. So it was necessary for him to do that, if he, that was what he would have to do to submit before God to let go, because his God was the money. And even though he was willing to do everything else, his God was still the money. And Jesus told him, that can't be your God. All right? But this is a good principle. And really, if you think about it, as you've gone through life, you can think about different things, decisions you've made, money you spent, money you maybe shouldn't have spent a certain way, different things. But where are you today? You're still sitting here today. Still got clothes on your back. You got a car. You got a, a place to live with a dry roof. I mean, you got all kinds of things still today. No matter what kind of decisions you made before, God's going to keep watching over. He's going to keep taking care of you. What does Jesus say about the sparrows? He says, consider those sparrows. He takes care of all those little birds out there. Make sure they have feed. Make sure they're not dying. I mean, I know if I was a bird, if I just thought about it, I'd probably be dead, right? But because if you get like 20 below zero weather in Ohio, where do all those birds go? I don't know how the birds go or how they survive. But every spring we see all these birds again, and I rarely see many dead birds. And yet those are just little things. How much more does God take care of us? I mean, animals are important. God made animals. We should love animals and treat animals correctly and good and everything. But there's definitely a difference between animal kind and human kind, okay? <laughs> humans are way more important than animals by far. By far. You may not like humans because we got all the sin and everything. But yet we are made in the image and the likeness of God. Animals are not. And yet, and yet God takes care of the animal world so much how much more is he going to take care of the human world when we put our trust in him? And we should do things wisely. We shouldn't just be like, we know this means I give all my money and got nothing. Like I said, some of those churches, that I don't want to you know, make the... Black folks will tell you, okay? If you go to black churches, you talk to black folks, they'll tell you it's the truth, okay? I'm not being racist or saying anything bad. But some of those churches will say, put your hands in your pockets. Now put it all in the offering. Get it all in the offering. In fact, I know a woman, and you guys know her too, and she told me when she used to go to one of her churches, she would leave all of her money inside her car locked up because she knew the preacher had a way of getting every single dollar out of her wallet. That's horrible. That's terrible, okay? I'm not that preacher. I'm not trying to take the dollars out of your wallets or anything. I'm just trying to teach you what the Word of the Lord says. Your giving is between you and God, okay? I'm not trying to... to uh, 
to rob you, okay? I was I would consider I would go home and feel so sinful if I was like, get all your hands in your pockets, get all the monies out. I want it all. That's horrible, you know. I would have to be like the rich young ruler then, you know. I mean, that'd be to be terrible to do that. All right. But I wrote down here: if you want to increase money, you've got to share it. If you if you if you want to lose it, you're going to hoard it. That's the principle. This is saying that's this verse paraphrase. I bet if you went to like the Message Bible or maybe New Living Translation, it would say a little bit closer, Proverbs 11, 24, to what I wrote at the top right there. Now, I didn't check the paraphrase versions, but that's basically what it's saying right there. If you want to increase your money, you got to share your money. If you want to lose it, you're going to hoard all your money. So now it goes back here. It says, When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. So he's letting them pick on who is going to be the faithful steward of their money to take it there. And I wrote up on the top, inflexibility can be a great barrier to knowing and doing the Lord's work. And that goes back to all those other things I said, that if we're inflexible and we refuse to change, we refuse to go where the Lord will have us to go, we're, we're going to have a barrier in life. We're not going to go forward where we need to go forward. So we got to be flexible with God all, all the time. I wrote that at the top of this one. Flexibility is not a sign of weakness, but of humility. To be flexible doesn't mean you're a weak fellow. It means you're a humble fellow. And I'll tell you, it says about Moses in the Old Testament, he was the most humble man who ever lived. And yet he led a nation of two million Israelites, two million Jews, into freedom out of slavery through 40 years in the wilderness and then their children who weren't cursed because of their parents all their sins except for Joshua and Caleb got to go forward into the promised land and become what they became today even right there you know Jesus came through the lineage of the Jews all kinds of things but Moses was a very humble man and look at the great things God did with that humbleness God can use you like crazy when you're humble if you got a bunch of pride Pride is definitely something that's going to put you in a tiny little box that you'll have little space to move, little space to grow, and it's a bad thing. So it's good to be flexible. But I will come to you after I go through Macedonia, for I am going through Macedonia. You know, Paul, he made the most of his time. That's, that's the principle I got out of this. Every place Paul went, he made it count. He made every day worth the living. He didn't waste his time. He desperately wanted to go to these Corinthian guys, but he said, first, he goes, after I go through Macedonia. He was going to go through Macedonia and do some preaching there and share the word there. And most of these places were not places that were vacation spots. They weren't places that Paul was being treated nicely. If you read the book of Acts, you, you can list up. I seen a list the other day at a, a Bible study. I went to my brother. If you go and see a list of things, Paul had like 12 horrible things happen to him. He got stoned. He got whipped multiple times. He was, riots started over it. They threw him in prison. Paul wasn't going to vacation land spots. He was on a mission. In fact, God even said when he saved Paul in the book of Acts on the road to Damascus, and he was talking to the guy that he wanted him to go and lay hands on his eyes so he could be healed and so he could see, he goes, I will make Paul suffer. He will suffer. That's what God said about Paul. But you know what? I bet you if Paul could go back, he wouldn't trade one of those days for anything. I bet you throughout eternity now, for those 30 years or so that he went on the mission field following Jesus Christ, I bet he has rewards in heaven that are still blessing him like crazy, these rewards that he gained the kingdom of heaven by spending time suffering on this side of earth for the kingdom of God and for what was to come because he saw it as so much more important. But we have to try to make the most of our time too. And I tell you, a bad place to be is when you don't do anything. And that's the type of place, when you get stuck in a rut where you don't do anything, that's where you go to prayer. You go to prayer and you say, God, help me out. I'm in a really stuck spot right now. And maybe, like my little note said here, companionship. You get yourself to church. You get yourself off with some other people in the body of Christ and you talk to them. And just be like good medicine happening within you right there. But to be all alone and be stuck is a hard place to be, all right? And he, he made sure it didn't happen. He was always going to prayer. He was always pushing himself. And he was either making believers or celebrating with believers. 
So he says, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may send me on my way wherever I may go. So he's like, maybe I'll even spend the whole winter with you guys. And I wrote, the Lord's work always, Lord's work is always in a spirit of unity, teamwork, and mutual dependence. Always God's work is like that. Everywhere you read through the Bible, God is doing things with the church, with the groups of people, with believers together. He never did, we don't read stuff about him doing something with just one person, okay? We read about stuff he did like in one prophet's life, but it affected a whole nation of people, or all kinds of people around that prophet. So it wasn't just the prophet, it wasn't just the person. It's always in unity, it's always in teamwork, and it's always depending upon one another. And that's basically what Paul's saying here, you know, I'm going to come, I'm going to see you, maybe even stay the winter with you guys. And think about some of the things that Paul told these guys, and and how harsh he was at times in Corinthians, and yet he still felt totally welcome by those brothers and sisters, you know, because he knew they were his brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, For I do not wish to see you now just in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time, if the Lord permits. I may have spelling thing on top here, but I wrote, The only opportunity we can be sure of having is the one we have right now. That's the only thing we can be sure about, is right here, right now. We can't be sure about tomorrow. We can't change what the past did. We can only be sure about right now. All right? And he says he's hoping he's going to remain for some time. But you know what he says? If the Lord permits. He doesn't know. He's giving it up to God. If the Lord wills. If the Lord wills is not a way to look at life. You know, you, you make plans and it, God laughs. That's actually a Bible verse. It says, you know, man makes plans and God laughs. All right, so imagine that. You think, man, I've done all this planning, and God just laughs about all the planning and all the hard work I did. I know I've done a lot of things sometimes, but I've worked so hard towards something just to see it all fall apart and never even work out that way. And that happens in life, you know. But what matters is where am I today with Jesus Christ? Where am I today with my walk with the Lord? Where am I today with my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Those are things that matter right there. And that's how we get ready to keep going forward. And the only thing we can sure about is right here and right now. We can be sure right now we're in church. Right now you're hearing the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 preached. Alright? That's what you can be sure about. He says, but I will remain at Ephesus until Pentecost. And uh, why did Paul have such a great investment with Ephesus and Corinthians? Is because he founded those two churches. You know, Paul spent, I think, I might be wrong, but I think he spent Three years in Ephesus. And John was also a pastor of Ephesus. John who wrote the book of Revelation. And who wrote the Gospel of John. The Epistles of John. So these guys had investment in these churches. Because they were their churches. And yet even the church of Ephesus. In the book of Revelation. That John's writing. It had lost its first love. Okay. I think I'm right with that with Ephesus. Ephesus. The Ephesian church had lost their first love. And just a little while after having Paul and John. Come alongside them. To, uh, to build them up where they were at. You know? So we all could go down in our pits and up and down. But Paul had great investment in Ephesus, and he also had a great investment in Corinth, who these guys were he wrote the letter to. For a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So, so good, good opportunity has opened up to Paul to go to Ephesus and to go to Macedonia, and he said it was a wide door of opportunity but there are many adversaries. And to hear a guy like Paul say many adversaries, you better believe the danger level is high. You know, you talk about probability of danger, bad things happening to you. For a guy like Paul who went through bad things every single day, that was extreme. All right, And you can look at Revelation 3, 7. It talks about Jesus at the door knocking and things. His opening and closing of doors are always entirely God's doing. Okay? If God is at the door and he's knocking, better open up that door, okay? Better open up that door to Christ. And we must enter. These aren't kind of things where, where we should decide on our own what we want to do. If we know that God wants to do something in our life or with us or wherever we're at, we need to do it. Who are we to defy the almighty God? You know, it's not like some kind of a, a equal rights thing. Where, yeah, God, if you do this, maybe I'll do that, and we're bargaining or something. If God comes to us and gives us an open door, we need to walk through that door. It's not an option. It's something that the, the almighty creator of the universe is doing. The same person who is being loving and graceful 
that can allow us in and giving us this opportunity is also the same person who could just think or just flick his fingers or speak a word and you will be eternally suffering in a torture. It's the same person, all right? The same person as God. We need to look for open doors. We need to look for opportunities. And we need to move forward with what God presents before us. And sometimes maybe you feel like, I don't have the energy for that. I'm too weak for that. I don't know how I could do it. Well, most of those doors that opened up in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, none of them thought they could do it. You know, Moses didn't think he could speak well. And God sent him to speak. You know, uh, uh, Jonah didn't want to go to the place where God wanted to take him, but he went and look what God did with him there. Uh, Gideon, Gideon was, was hiding in the wine press, it says, and Jesus shows up to him and says, Oh, you mighty man of valor. He never knew he could lead an army to defeat the enemies of the country and free the nation. Just this little guy hanging out there. So most of the time when you read the Bible, it's just like where you may be today thinking, I can't do that. I'm just too small or I can't do all those kind of things. And yet, if you trust God, miracles and great things can and will happen. All right? If the Lord's involved with it, great things are going to come up right there. And it's not going to happen until you trust Him. All right? God's not forcing us through these doors. He's opened up these doors, but we need to, we need to enter into these doors. There is, a, there, is a, there is an element of responsibility on our side. And really, if you look at the big picture, it's a very small element of responsibility. Our greatest enemy is ourself. Most of the time, is our greatest enemy is ourself. We are the ones keeping ourselves stuck where we're stuck at. And it's a hard truth right there, especially if you talk to somebody who's really miserable where they're stuck. But most of the time, it's the truth, is we stick ourselves where we're sticking. It says, Now if Timothy comes... See that he is with you without cause to be afraid, for he is doing the Lord's work, as also I am. So he's letting them know, hey, Timothy's a good guy. Don't give him cause to be afraid. Don't be rough on the fellow. But actually, they were kind of rough on Paul. How many times does Paul have to give his testimony about how he was chosen by God to be an apostle, even with the same church that he started? And they're doubting him all the time. Imagine how hard it would be on another outsider that comes. But he's, like, he's like, don't do that to Timothy. And also I wrote, if you don't have any opposition in your life, you're probably also serving in the wrong place. Because if you're not having hard times where you're at, you're probably, you're probably not in the right place. You're in too comfortable of a place. I, I heard a saying once about quitting, is that if you don't experience failure from time to time, you know you're not pushing your limits. You know, you're, you know you, there's, more, there's more that you're capable of if you're not hitting failure. But when you hit failure, at least you know, you know what, I did it my best, and I failed, and it's okay, I'm going to keep on going. But I know that I'm pushing myself so hard that failure happened, at least I went that far. People that are so safe and never hit any failure, imagine the potential that they have that's not even being used. The gifts that God has given them, but they don't even use. And so we will have opposition, and, and God has promised us, Jesus promised us, in this life you will have tribulation. There's no health and wealth gospel here. There's no become a Christian and you're going to have a wonderful, great life and don't worry. Things are going to be so easy for you. Jesus quite said the opposite. He said, when you become a Christian, you're going to have trouble. He told the guy about Paul, he will suffer for me. There's nothing easy about being a Christian. It's definitely better in the big picture than not being a Christian, though, because then your life was totally wasted and you're just going to go eternally pay. Okay? But being a Christian in a lost, broken world is a hard thing to do. And it says the devil is our adversary and he is always working. The devil is no lazy guy. I don't think the devil ever takes a day off. He doesn't have to recuperate like you and I do when we have some hard days and we got to recuperate. He doesn't have those kind of recuperation days. His days are numbered, his days are short, and he knows that his days are really coming to an end, and he's working very hard against us. And think about how many millions of demons he has underneath him working hard as well, because they know the same thing. They've been in the kingdom of heaven. They know that God is real. They probably have more faith about God being real than many of us have faith about God being real. And they also know that the Bible is true and it does not lie and everything is going to be so they know their time is limited. If we were to grab hold of that time like the devil and the demons have about our short little lives that we have, maybe our lives would be 
so much better live for Christ than not, because we realize our time is limited as well. There's not a one of us in here that's not going to die. Don't think it's not going to be me. It's going to be every single one of us. Unless the rapture happens and the Lord comes back first. But then the Bible says, how, will he find faith when he returns? Wouldn't it be a horrible thing if you're slacking and lazy and God shows back up and then your days are over with? If it, oh, you know, I had all these plans. I want to do this. I want to do that. But I chose not to do anything because I was indecisive. That's not a good place to be. So I said, but send him on his way in peace, so that he may come to me, for I expect him with the brethren. The brethren of the believers. It's all about Timothy. But concerning Apollos, our brother, I encouraged him greatly to come to you with the brethren, and it was not at all his desire to come now. But he will come when he has opportunity. Sometimes we're not able to do things. Who knows what Apollos was doing? I'm not sure. What was Apollos about? That he didn't even want to go to the town of Corinth? I don't know. Maybe it was all that sin going on in the town of Corinth. He's like, oh, I'm already dealing with enough troubles right here to go to that sinful city with all that madness going on. All right? But he said that Apollos, he really encouraged him, but you know what? It wasn't his desire to come now. But he says he'll come when he has opportunity. And see that how Paul's not giving up on people. He's not like, you know what? Apollos made me mad because he didn't do what I said. Forget him. He's not doing that. You know, he said, you know, Paul, Apollos has his desires. We see five commands in this last chapter. It's to be on alert, to stand firm in the faith, and to act like men, and to be strong, and to do it in love. So I tell you, if all things you forget today, if you can remember those five things, you've done really good. There's five things. So maybe you won't remember all five things. Remember love, though, okay? But to be alert, all right? We've got to be on the alert. i got a slide talking about alertness coming up. To stand firm in the faith, to act like men. Men acting like men. I love those kind of verses. There's a lot of places in the Bible that says, stand up like a man. That's what God told Job when Job had to get a good talking to from God. You know, there's a lot of places in the Bible that says, stand up like a man. That's how we've got to be as men. Men are supposed to be leading. They're not supposed to be non-leading, okay? They're not supposed to be the submissive ones. The men are supposed to be the, the leaders. And in our society, things are so messed up that a lot of ladies are more leaders than men are because because we're not standing up like men like we should stand up right and that's not being mean or hateful or hurtful it's being godly okay we got to stand up and be godly men and it says here he says that the, all things everything all that you do be done in love love is what will keep everything in check if you lose the love portion out of your following the lord you'll be called legalistic hateful You'll be, you'll be abrasive sandpaper that's like rubbing them in such a way that it's not going to refine them. It's going to destroy the other people. You may say all the right things with the Bible, but if you miss the love portion of it, you've missed it all. Okay? You, you, there's a lot of people, a lot of cults, different things that use the Bible and twist it and push a lot of bad things on it. And you know what? There's no love in those kind of places. And this is what is missing is the love. Love is the glue that holds it all together. And we've got to remember that above all things, that if we lose the love, we're really messed up. The principles don't work without the love, okay? Love's like the battery, you know, that you make a little radio or whatever you make, but if it doesn't have batteries, it's not going to work. If you, can, you can have all these things in your knowledge and your wisdom, have it down inside, but you pull the love out of yourself, it's not going to work like it's supposed to work. But here's what it talks about with being alert. Be on alert against Satan. In 1 Peter, it calls Satan a roaring lion is, who's prowling about, seeking whom he may devour. Some folks believe Satan's in chains right now. I don't know how they even grasp onto that idea. Look at all the horror and the evil and different things going on today. Satan is alive and well, and he's moving around like a roaring lion, so we've got to be careful. Be on alert for temptation, tells us in Mark. You know, to be careful, because temptation is all over the place all the time for all of us. Watch for apathy and indifference. Revelation 3 tells us that. We don't want to be apathetic and indifferent and just be like, I don't care, I don't know, you know, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. We don't want to be there. To neglect Scripture is to disregard it and treat it as if it means nothing. And that's a strong statement right there, but I think that's a very biblical statement. To neglect your Bible is to disregard it and treat it as if it means nothing. 
So every one of us should be in the Bible. We should be reading the Bible. It shouldn't just be like, oh yeah, I know I got to read the Bible. Well, how many times have you read the Bible? Never. You know, how, how often do you read the Bible? I hear it once in a while. I mean, it should be something that is very important to us. Open up that Bible and read it. And I'll tell you what, sometimes in my chaplain visits, and I'm so blessed that in our secular world I'm able to do such a thing, but all chaplains, as far as I know, are able to. They may not choose to, but sacred writings, which the secular world considers the Bible as a sacred writing, are able to be used, to be spoken. You know, we learn that, you know, we just read a psalm out to a person and say, let that sit with you. What does that mean to you? How, do, how does it sit with you? What does it do to you? Because you're speaking the spoken word of God. You want to hear God out loud? Read your Bible out loud, because these are the words of God. So many folks who go around saying that God told them things, and yet they're not even reading their Bibles. You know, the Bible is the spoken word of God. When you read that out, this is God's word. You can say, God said this. If it's scripture, and you're a solid, you're solid beyond solid can be. You know, that's something you can always say, God said this. And you can show them in the scripture where he said it. Be on alert for false teachers. They're all over the place. All kinds of false teachers. Always trying to dissuade us and show us something new. I heard a saying once, and I kind of like it, no new theology is good theology. So no new theology is good theology. When you start hearing something brand new talked about, it's probably not a good thing, all right? How by longing for the pure milk of the word. The Bible tells us how do we stay alert? How do we grow with God? In 1 Peter 2, 2, it says by longing for the pure milk of the word. Now, even if you don't long for it, start to read it. Get it in you. It's like vegetables as a kid. If your kid never eats any vegetables, it'll probably be an unhealthy kid. You know, this is your vegetables. This is your way to grow. You start reading the Word of God. And also, knowing right doctrine. So many people today, get they go from one extreme to the other extreme, okay? They say, oh, this doctrine, different things divides us all, and we ought to just have one denomination and not all these different denominations and things. And they just throw away all the... The things that are correct to sacrifice just to get along. And we can't do that. We do want to always get along. Unity is very important, but so is right doctrine at the same time. And how does that work? In my view, how it works is here's my right doctrine, here's my love, and they're both present all the time. And maybe I'm not going to smother them all over with right doctrine at the time. Okay, I can always smother them all over with love all the time, though. But my right doctrine is my base, and I'm not going to shift off of knowing what I believe, knowing what the Bible says, to sacrifice for unity, and neither do I have to throw away my right doctrine to do that, all right? But you have to go with wisdom and know when you're going to bring the right doctrine in to paint the picture, and when you're just going to smear them all over with love, okay? And the way to smear them all with love is talk about the gospel, that Jesus died for me. I haven't ran into anybody hardly lately that I can't share with them that is dying or something, that you know what? Jesus died for you. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you repent of your sins and believe in Him, submit to Him as the Lord God Almighty and your Savior, you will be saved. And He did it all on the cross. He did it all for you. I mean, people hear that that are in dire situations, and they run to it. They're like, wow, is this the truth? This is reality? And indeed, it is reality right there, okay? And indeed, later, if they don't die or something, let's hope they start to learn some right doctrine and different things. So to make sure that this is real for them, okay? That it wasn't just, I just want the goodness, and I'm still going to keep being with who I am. To come to God, we have got to submit. We have to first know that we need a Savior. That we're a sinner, we're doomed, and we're hopeless. There's nobody, everybody going to heaven. It's a total lie. Jesus said, tons of people are going to hell. He said, many will even say, Lord, Lord, and I'll cast them off into the fire and say, I never knew you. Many are going to claim to be Christians and won't even be Christians. How many are out there that aren't even Christians and hate Christianity and people, they try to say, well, I'm going to go to heaven too. I tell you what, that is horribly unjust. In fact, I heard it said on the radio this week and it made me catch on real quick. I like this and because it's so awfully said. They go, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. And then the response was, maybe it was Rabbi Zacharias, he said, what is a good person? Is it your judgment of who a good person is? Is it your judgment on what, what sexual gender they are? Or is it your judgment on how they navigate this or treat people there? So depending on who you say is a good person is going to heaven, 
that sounds pretty unjust as well to me. That, I mean, think about that. How many people you walk about, if you actually said define a good person, their definition would be much different than somebody else's definition of a good person. The Bible tells us that none are good. Nobody's a good person is what the Bible tells us. It starts us off that none of us are good in any way in God's eyes whatsoever. No whatsoever. That we all desperately need Jesus Christ. So all these false teachers out there teaching all this stuff is horrible. But one thing we can do is we can learn how to clearly teach the gospel, the most important thing, involved in the right doctrine of what is the real gospel, and make a real difference in our world around us and people's lives for eternity. And think about this. Paul went to heaven. If you, We're going to read it in 2 Corinthians, but it's a little ways down the track. 2 Corinthians 12. Paul died and went to heaven, we think, right? He says, I knew a man who got caught up to the third heaven. And most people think that he's talking about himself. That he got caught up to the third heaven, that he saw heaven and things. You know, th third heaven, what's that? Well, some folks, the way I like to understand it, first heaven is right here. The air we breathe looking around us. The second heaven is outer space where the stars are. And the third heaven is where God dwells. All right, so Paul says he got to go to heaven. And then right after that, as you read in context... Paul says, and God sent a messenger of Satan to me to put a thorn of flesh in my side. And I prayed three times, and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. So even Paul, as, as a mighty of an apostle as he was, and a God follower, he got some kind of pride issue or something when he got to pulled up to heaven, that God had to send a demon to stick by his side for the rest of his days to keep him humble after all that. I mean, I don't know, maybe it was a pride. We don't know for sure what is a thorn in the flesh. But if you read in context, Paul talks about going to heaven, and then he talks about this thorn in the flesh. And it really rolls together when you start to read in context. And you can see how God is using all things together to work for good to those who love God. And uh, we can know for one thing, Jesus said at the end of all that, when we get confused about putting our mind around it, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. God's grace is sufficient for every single one of us. There's not a one of us that God's grace isn't enough. And I, and I wrote at the top, pray, remember what Jesus did, and what he is going to do. You know, So this is your fallback right here. When you're having tough times, go to pray. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Keep praying. Then think about what did Jesus do for you. He died on that cross for you. He rose the third day for you. He's alive and well. And think about what he's going to do. He's going to come back that every eye will see him as he comes back in the clouds. And he destroys this earth. For all the sin and brokenness, and he brings into salvation all those who believe in him. It's coming. Think about those big things, the big picture. Try to hold on to the big picture so those tiny little pictures don't get you all messed up in life. Because they can easily get us messed up. Now I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for a ministry to the saints. <coughs> Interesting thing here, to go to different versions... King James Version in this verse, instead of the word devoted, it used the word addicted. <coughs> we only think of addiction in a negative sense. Being addicted to God is a good thing, okay? If you go without days without prayer and your life is hurting because of it and you're feeling withdrawal, that's a good thing. To draw you back to go get some more God in your life, okay? So we should be addicted to Jesus Christ and addicted to his word. That you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. So he's telling you, okay, we need to be working together. We need to put ourselves in subjection and listen to one another. And I wrote at the top, God did not make us only for himself, but for each other. God didn't just, God did, I mean, everything glorifies God, right? Because God made all things for himself. Everything is for his glory and for him. But isn't it a blessing that God also made us for one another? You know, God tells us to be with one another, to love one another, to treat one another the right way. A lot of things. I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus and Achaicus, Achaicus because they have supplied what was lacking on your part. <coughs> so, whatever Paul didn't get from the Corinthians, he's getting from these guys. They were like cold water to a weary spirit. You know, Paul's trying to work hard to help the Corinthians, they're coming along and they're helping Paul. They're coming along and they're being of a good aid and assistance to him. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to get some help as well. We all need help. You know, we all need to lean on one another. I like the song, Lean on Me. We all need that kind of leaning on one another. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. So God can comfort us directly, but often 
He comforts us through other people. And notice that in life. Think about your own life. Think about how you walk with God. Sometimes you'll just get in the Word and God will just comfort you so much and everything will be okay. And other times, you'll, you'll be rough and down and you eat the Word and it may seem dry and, and you're just not getting alive and somebody else will come by and start talking to you. That companionship, the fellowship, the connection. And all of a sudden, it's like the things are so much better in your life again. All right, And God does do that. He'll sometimes work through others to give you comfort that He wants to give to you. <coughs> the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. And notice hospitality was a notable mark of Christian love. There were a lot of house churches because they were getting killed and dragged out in the streets and stuff, so they had to go to house to worship. Some people say it'll come like that in America too one day. I hope not, but, you know, who knows? It might go back there like that. Is, are we going to stop? No. Whatever way is feasible, whatever way we can make it, we're going to keep gathering together. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, anytime you read in the Bible about kissing, there's only two times that it's talking about romantic kissing. I found this is pretty amazing. Maybe the guy I found this from is wrong. But I thought it was pretty fascinating this guy pointed this out. There's only there's a verse in Proverbs 7.13 about, about kissing romantically. And Song of Songs by Solomon, which the whole book is about romantic stuff, is the only other place that talks about a romantic kiss. All the other kisses were just like part of friendship, like the way we shake hands or hug or different things. And back then they did have holy kisses. In fact, they got to kissing so much that in the 6th century, somebody made it a rule that you can't kiss dead bodies anymore. Because people were kissing the dead bodies and everything all the time. You know, they're saying goodbye. Because they made it like a church rule back in the 6th century, don't kiss a dead body. But, but kissing wasn't a bad thing. All right? Now today, in today's society... Somebody kisses you, you feel all strange about it because we're in a society that we're brought to feel strange about that stuff. But at least give the guy a good handshake or a good hug or, or a good camaraderie type of thing. You know, connect with somebody a little bit. That's a good thing. It's, if we're not touching anybody, it's something. I tell you, some of these old folks that I'm with that are dying, I grab their hand and hold it, and they grab my hand back and hold it. And I sometimes think, wow, I thought that person was a vegetable. I thought they didn't know anything going on. And, and the way that they grab my hand and the moments when they grab my hand, how they do, and when I pray and stuff, I can know, wow, they're in there and they're hearing every single thing I've said or every single thing their loved ones have said around them right here. And it means something. I mean, I sure, if I'm laying on my deathbed and somebody I love holds my hand, it's going to mean an awful lot to me right there rather than such a coldness that can go on in our society that we don't touch anybody or do anything and it shouldn't be like that. We should be loving one another. The greeting is in my own hand, Paul. And the reason he says this is because a lot of Paul's writings, he had a guy that was like a scribe next to him doing all the writing. He was his typewriter. So he would say the stuff out, and this guy would write it. In this last portion, Paul wrote the greeting in his own hand. So they would see, back then, the church that got it, they'd see a different signature. And they'd be like, wow, Paul even cared enough to write it himself. Maybe like the way we see somebody sign a book or something. So Paul explains that. He says, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha. Man, that is a hard saying right there. All right, and let, this totally goes opposition of the people that say everybody's going to heaven. Look at Paul, what he said. He said, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. <coughs> you know what I think Paul's saying by this? He's saying that the opportunity that is right now to receive Christ before you are taken away forever. Because the moment you die without Christ in your life, we will never see that person ever, ever again. The saddest funerals I've ever been to, and I see, is when I have reason to believe because the person never went to church, because they, they told people they hate God, because they said they don't believe, that when they die, it's like a gloom over it. Because you think, not only is it sad that we've lost a loved one or somebody we know, but we will never, ever see them again, ever. Forever. All of eternity. And where they'll be isn't a place that we can think, well, they're in a nice place on vacation. They're in the worst place of suffering you could ever imagine, okay? And the Bible, some places, calls it the middle of the earth with a fire and things. It's a horrible thing. And that's what happens if you don't love the Lord. So, like I said, it's not an option to follow the Lord's commands and to enter into salvation. When God opens the door for you to come and be saved, you need to be saved. You need to walk into that door. 
It's not an option. It's for your benefit by far. <coughs> this is how Paul closes his book to the letter of the Corinthians. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. And this is what this is this is what he says, is the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. And this is what I said in the beginning, the grace and love summarize all of Paul's message to the Corinthians. Because he says, this is the last slide I have. <coughs> My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. So what's the biggest thing? Grace and love. And what is grace? It's God's demerited favor. Okay, I always said unmerited favor until a guy explained to me. He said unmerited favor would be like I gave you all a piece of candy, a bunch of students in the classroom that didn't deserve it. That's unmerited favor. He said demerited favor is the kid in the classroom who's throwing spitballs at me and being loud and obnoxious and a really bad kid, I give him a piece of candy. That's the way it really is in real life with every single one of us. None of us were just kids in a classroom watching. We were all dirty sinners, bound for hell, totally hopeless, no hope whatsoever until God Almighty reached into our lives, opened up that door, and saved us. That's just like the kid that was doing badness to him. The Bible says that we were enemies of him, and he died for us while we were his enemy. It doesn't say that we were, like, neutral. It says we were his enemy, and yet he loved us so much that he died for us. So that's God's grace extended toward us. And he says, he says, the grace of the Lord be with you all. Be with you, and my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. And how did Paul even have love? How do any of us have love? Because God first loved us. All we have is a broken picture of love before we get the real love of Christ. And it's just like the image and the likeness of God that every single human being is made in, even the ones who deny Christ. They're in a broken image and likeness of God. Every single human being is. That's what I said. Humankind is different from animal kind. And yet, and yet, there is hope for every single person if they were to call out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they could be saved. And it's a beautiful thing. And what are we commanded to do? To go and to tell. To share with everybody. To preach it from the rooftops. And to share the gospel and to be with folks. And like I said, think about that picture. Here is right doctrine, which I think is super essential. You can't really read the Bible and not get right doctrine because that's where all our doctrine comes from. We may have sometimes different interpretations of the right doctrine. A little arguments or something. It's hard for us to understand some great mysteries of God. But that's the right doctrine. Here's the law, and it has to kind of mix all over the place in all of our lives, in the areas of our life, and how we deal with people, how we deal with ourselves, how we do all kinds of things in life. It's got to be love of God and the right doctrine, and the love supersedes the right doctrine, because in right doctrine is also love. It's like on both sides, okay? Because it says in the Bible that God is love. So we got to be able to be doing it with so much love and stuff, all right? And if somebody says, you sure aren't loving, well... Go to the bottom of that. Be like, what is it that I'm doing that's so unloving? And maybe be willing to humble yourself a little bit. Okay, you know, I'm sorry about that. You know, let's take a few steps back. I'm going to take a step back. And let's, let me hear you out. <coughs> hear what you have to say. Try to get connection. Try to get fellowship. And then start to bring that love of Christ to what Jesus did and how much Jesus loved him. That he died for him. He rose from the dead. He's coming back again. And share that truth with him. I mean, we have a Savior. It's something to be excited about. It makes us want to jump up and down sometimes and shout and raise our hands and, and be pumped up, you know? We feel like that sometimes as we're following the Lord. We've got to get fed. Sometimes, sometimes on our high points when we're following the Lord, we should feel energetic and excited. And yes, because as we have a Savior. We have a Savior. We're not some cold, dead religion that doesn't have a Savior or is depending on our own works for salvation to get there or it can doesn't know when we die if we're going to go to heaven. The Bible tells us, if you believe in me, he says, I have, what? He goes, what don't you believe? He goes, I have told you already, I've gone, I go to prepare a place for you. He didn't say, maybe I do. He did do it. He has done it. And he is waiting there for us. And it says, when we die, we will be with him. So even in the most hardness 